Good morning, interweb. Let's world build. Morphemes are the atoms of language, units of speech we can't break down into smaller meaningful parts. Break is a single morpheme word, it has a one to one morpheme per word ratio. Break a bull features two morphemes, two to one, and unbreakable features three, three to one. Morphemes can either be bounded or free. Free morphemes can exist in isolation and still make sense. Bounded morphemes are only meaningful when tacked onto other words. When we affix morphemes to words to indicate something grammatical, it's called inflection. In English, we inflect for plurality, tense, the third person singular, the present participle, to show scale in adjectives, and so on. Inflectional morphology differs from the derivational morphology from the last video in that the meaning of inflected words are not changed. Ergo, they don't usually get their own separate dictionary entries. More on this in later videos, but for now, just take it that to inflect the word is to affix it to convey grammatical features. Got it? Cool. Now, in theory, all languages exist somewhere on a spectrum that goes from analytical to synthetic to polysynthetic. Analytical languages tend to have a low morpheme to word ratio, little to no inflection, and in extreme cases make limited use of derivation and compounding when forming words. We call these extreme cases isolating languages. Now, languages in which words tend to consist of more than one morpheme are called synthetic. These languages tend to have plenty of inflection, derivation, and compounding. Extremely synthetic languages in which words consist of many, many morphemes are called polysynthetic languages. They make use of an epic amount of inflection, derivation, and compounding to create really complex structures. Analytical and isolating languages tend to be located in East and Southeast Asia, West Africa, and South Africa. These languages all share some interesting common features. They use predominantly monosyllabic morphemes, and sometimes even monosyllabic words. They use tones, they use helper words and word order to convey grammatical intent, and their grammatical rules are way less rigid than those of synthetic languages. Consider the Chinese sentence Ni Bu Lai Wo Bo Ku, which, when pronounced correctly, could mean If you don't come, I won't go. When you don't come, I won't go. Since you don't come, I won't go. And you won't come, and I won't go. If context serves to sufficiently delineate meaning, then all is well in the world. If not, helper words for if, when, since, and, and, etc. can be brought in. Word order also plays an important role here. Take the English sentence, Bob ate burgers. English word order is almost always of the form SVO, subject, verb, object, the person or thing about whom the statement is made, the doing word, and the thing acted on by the subject. If we change the words about, burgers ate Bob, Bob goes from being the subject to the object based on his location within the clause and the meaning of the sentence is totally changed. Synthetic languages may encode this kind of thing with inflections, so their word order is freed up. Now we can further subdivide synthetic and polysynthetic languages into agglutinative and fusional languages. On the agglutinative side, we have some Bantu languages, Japanese, Korean, and Turkish as examples. And on the fusional side, you're looking at French, Russian, Greek, and Sanskrit, that kind of thing. Agglutinative and fusional languages tend to be polar opposites of each other. Agglutinative languages express only one meaning per morpheme, and each morpheme is distinct. They are literally glued on to roots. Whereas fusion languages express multiple meanings per morpheme, and they tend to be indistinct, literally fused to the root word. Take the Quechua word for I ate, mikurani. Here, miku means eat, ra marks the past tense, and ni marks the first person singular, I. Contrast that with I ate in Spanish, comi, where the E indicates first person singular, past tense, and indicative mood. That is a sentence that is a statement of fact. Personally, I really like fusional languages. You can't beat them when it comes to compactness, but interestingly, most of the world's languages are agglutinative, and many of the big stars of conlanging are too, Esperanto, Klingon, and Quenya. 
Polysynthetic languages, primarily found amongst Eskimo and American Indian languages, but also in the Northern Caucasus and Australia, take synthesis to a whole new level, compounding morphemes together to such an extent that sentence-spanning words are often produced. Like this beautiful Yupik word, meaning he had not yet said again that he was going to hunt reindeer. The breakdown of the word being reindeer hunt future say negation again third person singular indicative. Note that some of the morphemes are agglutinative and some are fusional. Or this Cheyenne name, meaning a bear stands in the shade. Now seeing as we're conlangers and not hardcore academic linguists, it's worth mentioning that which could exist beyond the polysynthetic languages, oligosynthetic languages. These do not exist in the real world, but if they did, they'd be like polysynthetic languages, except they'd have very few morphemes, say a hundred or so, and would combine them synthetically to form words far, far longer and more complex than those of known polysynthetic languages. Think newspeak and you're kinda in the right ballpark. Now in reality languages tend not to fall neatly into any one of these categories. Like Japanese treats its nouns analytically and its verbs synthetically. Also, natlangs are constantly evolving. In fact, linguist Orem H. Dixon theorizes that the evolution cycle of natlangs is to start out fusional and over time go more analytic, then agglutinative, and then loop back to fusional. Which is kind of neat, like maybe we could create a fusional protolang and modify it, literally simulating many thousands of years of evolution. Or maybe we could create a messy kitchen sink line that is bang in the middle of a transition from one type to another. Anyways, despite this being a somewhat outdated system, I still think it's really useful when it comes to conlang. It's nice to have an endgame. But along the way, choose a little from column A and a little from column B. Therein lies the fun of it. So there you go, types of conlang done. Tell me, what type of languages have you been creating? Good morning interweb, real time follow up. The linguist in this video is called RMW Dixon, not RMH Dixon. Apparently I can't even read my own scripts. Apologies. Follow up from the last video, I got a tweet from someone asking, well, hey, how do you get around this problem of derivation making your language look very similar? TLDR, it's a balancing act between the creation of new words and the derivation of those words and how we play with those scales will determine the flavor our language will have. Hardly any root words plus a ton of derivation and everything's gonna be somewhat homogenous. Loads of root words plus hardly any derivation and there's gonna be a huge variety in your language. That all being said, like, don't be afraid of homogeneity. It's a natural part of language. Like, take English. How many one syllable words can you think of that look and sound like the word black, for example. Tons. And then if we include two syllable words and three syllable words, even more. Homogeneity is okay. Natlangs do this, your conlangs should too. Don't be afraid of it. Anyways, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, Edgar